The Giants have won 10 straight games for the first time since 2004. Just unbelievable. This team is absolutely on a roll. They have put themselves in a great playoff position. And this game, though, wasn't without some controversy, but I'm going to explain why it actually, to me, wasn't that controversial at all. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on the show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Lockdown Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts, including YouTube. Check us out there if you have not already, and please hit that subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube. A championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. So for parts that fit, head to eBay Motors and look for the green check. Stay in the game with eBay Guaranteed Fit. eBayMotors.com, let's ride. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. And coming up on today's show, yes, we are going to be talking about how the Giants have won 10 in a row for the first time since 2004. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just incredible. And like I said, coming into this series, if either team kind of, you know, won three out of four or even swept that it was going to put... It was going to make a dramatic change to the playoff odds, and that's ultimately ultimately what I'm interested in. Initially, of course, you want to just you got to get into the postseason, and you know it is maybe a little bit early to t- to be talking about all that. But worth mentioning, coming into this series, the Giants and the Padres both, according to fan graphs, had playoff odds around sixty percent. The Padres were creeping up on 500. They were trying to... This is a huge series for the Padres. And so to lose three straight, and Giants will be going for four, a clean sweep today, as of right now, it shot both teams in uh, like 15 points in opposite directions. And so that's what I mean. Because right now, Fangraphs has the Giants playoff odds close to 75%. And again, they came into the series at 60%. So that's exactly what I'm talking about. And and the Padres came in at also around 60% odds and have fallen to 43.5%. And so just huge deviations here based on how this series has gone. And so it's enormous. And it's really, the Giants have put themselves in such a good playoff position. I mean, when we talk about nearly 75% odds, by the way, those are only the Braves and Dodgers have better playoff probabilities in the National League, according to fan graphs. And so, I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory because the Giants find themselves uh, as the top wildcard team at this moment in time. They're a half game ahead of the Marlins. I still believe the Marlins are overperforming their run differential by so much that uh, I expect them to come kind of crashing down to earth a little bit. But if the season were to have ended last night, it, you know, the Giants and the Marlins haven't played the same number of games. The Marlins have played one more game. So technically, like the season wouldn't end like that. But what would happen if you're the number one wildcard team is that you play the number two wildcard team at home in a best of three. And so the Giants would host the Marlins, which would be, uh, you know, a, a, a pretty good scenario. But obviously, I mean, at this point, the I was kind of honestly conceding the NL West when you had the D-backs having a great start and then you also had the Dodgers of course doing what they do and the Padres everybody expected to be up there as well and so I was kind of just thinking this is a year when you're probably if you're going to make the playoffs it's probably going to be via the wild card but at this point in time the Giants have almost as good of odds as any team in this division to actually win the division they're only two and a half games behind the D-backs, who are just having a great uh, start to their season. They're 45-30. and It's it's the second-best record in the National League. The Giants 
have the third best record in the National League. Uh, and the D-backs, last I checked, they were winning again today at the time of this recording. Yeah, they're up again. They're playing the Nationals right now. But guess who comes into town after the Padres leave? It's the Arizona Diamondbacks. Uh, the Giants are going to play that team. And so there's your chance. Again, Like I, just like I said with the Padres series, this is more about like really, really, like if the Giants could somehow find a way to sweep this Padres series and then welcome in the D-backs and if you even just win two out of three, but I mean, can can a guy dream about sweeping the D-backs as well and winning, that would be what, 14 straight at that point? Uh, if you do that, you're going to suddenly probably be favored to win the division your playoff odds are going to be like 90 something percent and so that's where we are right now is like uh and at this point the Giants could lose a couple times and it wouldn't kill their odds and so they've put themselves in that good position and that's just what's uh great to see and it doesn't look like a fluke as I mentioned with the Marlins for example there's a lot of weirdness going on in the National League in particular uh, with the Marlins, like I said, with a negative 18 run differential, they've been outscored by 18 runs on the season. It's hard to be nine games over 500 when you're being outscored on the season. And like the Reds, they've won 11 games in a row and they're in first place in the NL Central, but they've been outscored on the season. The Brewers have been outscored on the season and they're in second place in that division. And <clears throat> so I think that the Giants, they, I mean, I don't think this. I know this. They have the second best run differential in the National League. They've outscored opponents by 54 runs. Only the Braves have outscored their opponents by more. And run differential is really predictive of record. And so I I just like the position they're in. And one game at a time, now you're about to face Blake Snell. But uh, particularly like to focus on how the Giants got here, how they won game number 10 in a row last night, it was, it was kind of, kind of, the Giants were quiet through the first several innings as they have been. I think the backdrop on these 645 games, the hitter's eye, uh, hitter's background, there's this huge glare on it. And so nobody can see for the first three innings. And so it's kind of a problem with the ballpark, but it is what it is. And, and, both teams have to deal with it, but the Giants just had one four-run outburst, and that was it. So they, it wasn't like the best offensive night. It was another night where the pitching really stepped up, and the Padres really just failed to come through. They have like I think it's the lowest. Normally, this isn't something I discuss because I mean, in the first month of the season, the Giants had poor numbers with runners in scoring position, and I came on the show and I said I just don't think numbers like batting average with runners in scoring position, it matters a lot. Like in terms of how are you doing at scoring runs, it definitely matters in that sense, but it's not something that is like meaningful in the sense that if you're just doing really poorly in it, but generally you're like doing well otherwise, you would expect that eventually you're just going to perform in those situations like you perform in all other situations. But for the Padres, they have been the like historically bad hitting with runners in scoring position, and that has continued in this series. And the Giants, like I said, in April they were also bad, and since like May 1st they're number one, and that just that proves my point. It's not like oh they changed something. I just think they. They just are who they are. And so eventually I expect the Padres to break out of that as well. But right now they're like the worst in history in terms of batting average with runners in scoring position. It's like under 200 and that's continued in this series. But controversy or non-controversy, there was a play, the collision rule, and it affected this game. And I'm going to tell you why I don't think it was really all that controversial at all, despite a lot of hubbub about it. So we will get into that momentarily. But before we do, this episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs are my new favorite pair of shorts by a mile. They are what the best thing about them is that they make you look really good and that they're super comfortable because and it's kind of like the the innovative fabric is what's doing both of those things. It's making them comfortable and it's like stretching to your leg for a 
uh, look that's going to give you a truly sculpted look. And instead of being stiff and restricting cotton, Bird Dogs invented cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. And I can attest to this personally. That I have I wear them all the time. They are extremely comfortable and sharp looking. So go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. And you will also get, if you're on YouTube, you can see this, this free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on MLB for a free Yeti style tumbler. And you won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you. All right, as promised, we are going to discuss the controversial, non-controversial call at home plate last night that played a major role. There's no doubt it played a major role in the game, but there was some confusion. But to me, it's pretty straightforward. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day, every dayers. Tomorrow on the show, I'm going to be discussing this series with Javier Reyes from Locked on Padres. It's always a good time with Javier, and hopefully we're just burying him about a, a giant sweep here that and just feeling his pain and and doing victory laps that's what I hope to be discussing tomorrow the Giants play the Padres in game four of this series today at 12 45 Pacific and you can catch every pitch of the Giants hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app search Giants and so this play last night I mean it absolutely impacted the game and what it was was the home plate collision rule. The Giants had already put one run on the board in the bottom of the fifth. They led one to nothing. And Jock Peterson hit a rocket single into right field with Blake Sable on second base. Now, we can also discuss the concept that I have talked about a bunch of times whenever this happens. Whenever there's a runner thrown out at the plate, people inevitably like question the decision to send the runner. But I just have to say, like before we get to the controversial call, that if you are if you are a hundred percent successful at like not getting guys thrown out at the plate, it it's like mathematically extremely provable that you are not scoring as many runs as you could have. Because the next guy up, especially with two outs, is not he's very likely to make an out. Like just all hitters are very likely to make an out more likely than not and so with two outs you don't need to be safe 100 percent of the time for the send to be worth it and so I think it was kind of an easy send even though Tatis has a great arm great arm to send Sable and guess what it it did ultimately work out because like you forced the opposing team to play perfect defense and they didn't because Gary Sanchez violated the home plate collision rule and there seems to be like all this confusion and like it's obscure and nobody understands, but I'm going to lay it out pretty darn simple. The rule is you cannot block the path of the runner until you have the baseball as a catcher. And Gary Sanchez, simply put, if you watch the replay from any angle, he he was not blocking the path of the runner like for a long time. He was out in front of the plate in fair territory. But as the throw came in, the throw did not force him into the path of the runner. He kind of just started to position himself into the path of the runner prior to the ball arriving into his glove. And I I think that it was pretty clear to me he did not have to make the move he made. He was kind of barely blocking the plate, but what and Gabe Kapler said after the game and I hadn't heard it laid out this clearly, but Kapler said his understanding of the rule and the team's understanding of the rule is that basically the catcher can't have their any part of their body like their foot specifically like think of Gary Sanchez's left foot it can't be in foul territory before he has the baseball unless the throw forces him over there and if you you watch the replay his foot is standing you know one foot is just inside or outside the foul line and the ball then arrived, and if you watch too, you can see that from a certain angle, or pretty much any angle, you can see that as Sanchez started to do this, before he had the baseball, Blake Sable, running home, started to have to take a wide route. Like he, 
it's like he was blocked off by Gary Sanchez's body in front of the plate. And so Sable started to swing wide out to the right as he's running in. And that's exactly the point is that you, you, you can't, make him do that unless you have the ball already and so it was very straightforward to me and Kruk and Kipe were all over it like they they saw the replay and they said the Giants may actually have a shot at this and I agreed 100% it looked like I I expected the call to be overturned and so you know all due respect to the post game show but they they didn't understand what like the rule was and I'm a little surprised George Contos who played uh, Major League Baseball during the era, I believe, in which this rule has come into existence. And, you know, as Grant Brisby of The Athletic will tell you, it's not the Buster Posey rule. It is the Alex Avila rule. It is not something that came into existence just because of the Posey injury. It came into existence years later when the son of a Major League General Manager was injured in a home plate collision. And so anyway, it's just the catcher protection rule i mean it's good for the game protecting catchers i get it it was like fun to watch guys blow each other up at the plate but the injuries that happened i was at the buster posey game when he did get blown up by scott cousins and just completely like shredded his leg that's not good for the game when your stars or anybody gets injured like that and so protecting the players it's the point of the rule, and the rule is the rule, and I get it. Like you've got Tim Flannery on Twitter again. All due respect, but like talking about the good old days and blah blah blah. The rule just is the rule now. You cannot like the rule. That's fine. But in terms of like enforcing it in the game yesterday, it was pretty straightforward to be honest. And so I don't really understand the controversy. I will say the previous day there was a play with the Texas Rangers where Bruce Bochy is now the manager and the uh, game between the Rangers and the White Sox and the White Sox had a runner thrown out at the plate. It was the go ahead run in the bottom of the eighth and he was out by a mile. It was kind of similar to Sable and that the throw beat him by quite a bit. And anyway, if you watch the replay of that, I don't quite understand why that was called as a violation but maybe it's because he, again, was positioned in like foul territory. But the thing is, that catcher was behind the plate. Like he gave the runner the lane to the plate by vir- by virtue of being behind the plate himself. And so the runner could just go right into home. I guess you could make the case that the runner couldn't run straight through. Like you forced him to slide and you shouldn't. You sh- That's probably what it was, is you just can't, even if you're behind the plate, so, like, in some ways, common, you would think common sense would come into play, but the rule just is the rule. And so if you don't want to get violated for it, don't violate the rule. And, you know, I just, is it a flawed rule? It may be, but Kapler said it's that's, like, not his domain. He's just here to, to teach his players to not violate it, and when you see it and it doesn't get called, which... Home plate umpires are apparently told not to call this rule. They're just watching the play at the plate. And if if you want to argue that there was a violation, that will go to replay in New York. And that's what the Giants did. And the key here is that it led to that run counted. So that was two to nothing Giants. And then they got two more runs in the inning, four to nothing Giants. And they ended up winning four to two. And so if you take those three, quote, extra runs off the board, Giants only got one run, but you don't know how the rest of the game would have played out. And so, yeah, I mean, I just don't consider it that controversial. But the Giants did lose something in that inning because it got extended. And what they lost was a player in Mike Yastrzemski who hurt himself later on in that inning that, you know, if they didn't overturn that that play, then he wouldn't have gotten hurt in that same situation. So anyway, we'll discuss the latest with the injury to Mike Yastrzemski and what it means in just a minute. But first. All right, here we go. We're going to discuss Mike Yastrzemski getting hurt, how serious it is. He had an MRI and also a roster move and maybe a little bit of an unfair roster move as well. So 
Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. Every day is tomorrow. I'm going to be talking with Javier Reyes from Locked on Padres. It is always fun talking with him. And again, like if the Padres get swept, he's going to wear this. He he becomes the Joker and he wears like a, like a, I, I don't know. It's like a, like a, like a medieval clown. I forget the word, but a crazy hat. And he becomes a different personality and it's hilarious. And so let's hope for a sweep because that would be awesome the Giants play the Padres today at 1245 Pacific you can catch every pitch of the Giants hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app search Giants I think it's a Joker's hat like a the original Joker's hat like from older times I don't know what the heck I'm talking about but that's what to look forward to tomorrow hopefully so anyway this play uh Mike Yastrzemski Injured his hamstring uh, trying to go to third base. He made it safely to third on a J.D. Davis single to right. That was part of that extended inning where runs kept scoring after the collision rule overturned the call of out at the plate. And, you know, you just can't afford to lose Mike Yastrzemski right now. He's been he's been involved. I mean, he hit a walk off splash hit the other night. He hit a single to set something up as well like he's just been involved in everything and playing good defense he can play center if needed he's really good in right field he's just he does everything well he may not be a star but he's having a nice season and so they're already part of it too is that they're already missing Wilmer Flores is on the injured list Mitch Hanniger is completely on the injured list like shattered his bone essentially not shattered but severed his bone essentially and is out for a while and so you know Luis Matos holding his own makes it so you've got an, another outfielder that that you like and that you were going to play out there a lot anyway but suddenly if it's like Matos in center and Michael Conforto in right you're just getting thin and it's probably like Blake Sable in left against right-handed pitching And but he's your other catcher. And so you can't like wear him down playing every day in the outfield. And then when he's not in the outfield, he's catching. And then if he's catching, who's in left field? So it's not ideal. And then Lamont Wade Jr. is also banged up with a side tightness issue. But the good news is that both of these guys have kind of received good news. And Kapler, I don't know if they're just saying this because they want the Padres to be worried about it, but Kapler has said for two straight nights now, or yesterday and now today, that they hope Wade is available off the bench and that he's been going through lots of pregame work on the field. That's courtesy of, I think, Susan Slusser, who says he's been going through lots of pregame work on the field. And then, according to uh, Pavlov- Alex Pavlovich and Susan Slusser, we've got a We've got updates on the Yastrzemski MRI. And what Pavlovich said is that Mike Yastrzemski is hopeful he'll avoid the injured list. He said the MRI showed minor inflammation, but no strain. He wanted to stay in the game last night, but trainers didn't want to risk it. And then Slusser says, Yaz says his scan didn't even show a grade one strain, just inflammation. Coming out last night was a precaution, and he wanted to stay in but said he's glad quote better brains prevailed so those are basically the same reports there but that is very good news because like I said same with Lamont Wade Jr. they're like teetering on the edge of if you lose if both of these guys had to go on the injured list we we've seen it with Flores out you've got David VR at first base and I think that's not ideal but they're having to go kind of deep into their depth chart and I don't know if Wade is able to come back. Uh, Yeah, hopefully these two are just kind of back soon and can avoid stints on the injured list. And they're really important. And especially when you've already got other guys out, it's just a no brainer that you don't want to lose your good players. And so in a corresponding move, though, well, not a corresponding move, excuse me, but the Giants also made a roster move in that they recalled Bryce Johnson. And I think this has a lot to do with the fact that they're facing a left-handed pitcher today in Blake Snell, and they they don't have Mitch Hanniger. And so they haven't faced a lefty in a while. And, you know, they can have now Austin Slater out there. And who am I missing? What is the lineup? I'm, like, totally blanking. They can have Austin Slater out there. 
they can have not <laughs> okay i've got the lineup pulled up luis matos a total brain fart uh, austin slater's in left luis matos is in right and then bryce johnson who's better from the right side is playing center and so that's also a really good defensive outfield that the giants are able to put on the field today and yeah so i think that's a big reason why johnson was recalled was that if i mean especially if mike yastrzemski can't play he would be left on left anyway against Snell, but with Johnson, a switch hitter, basically you've got three right-handed bats in the lineup against Snell in your outfield. And then, yeah, as I look through there's only one left-handed bat in this lineup today, and that's Michael Conforto. You've got a couple switch hitters, but only one guy against Snell is going to step into that left-handed batter's box, and that's a good way to attack him. And so the Giants have a good shot Again, Alex Wood, left-handed pitcher, you know, against the top of the Padres lineup with Tatis and Soto can hit anybody and Machado and Bogarts, but Machado and Bogarts really have been struggling. Tatis and Soto are the guys, but anyway, Alex Wood was really good his last time out against the Dodgers, who also have a really good lineup. So Giants have a pretty good shot of winning 11 in a row. So we'll find out and... That is all the time we have for today. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. Every day is tomorrow. Javier Reyes, Locked on Padres, going to be a lot of fun. Giants play the Padres today at 1245 Pacific, and you can catch every pitch of the Giants' hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app Search Giants. Once again, my name is Ben Caspic. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Caspic, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. Helps me out a lot. So thank you in advance, and thanks to everyone who's done so already. I can't wait to be with you again tomorrow. Thanks again for listening. You are now Locked on Giants.